each family and each community has different members. Mm -hmm. So the, the younger members of the family are more attuned and engaged with brands. There are studies uh, that demonstrate that. And, um, and they have the expectation that you should know me. And because I am engaged or because I am doing things in public. And, uh, but there is also the conversation inside the family where the, the younger generation may be uh, sharing what they are discovering with uh, their family members and older people. And in that case, um, that may be acceptable. It may be, hey, you found this great deal right. through your activities. I wasn't targeted directly, but now I'm benefiting from it. So I kind of wanted to address a little bit the pass along value of um, utilizing data and appealing. Uh, so it's beyond just one to the brand to the consumer, but the brand to the consumer and their friends or their families or their communities. Yeah, I think there, there are certainly residual effects. And I think that's, I mean, that's the, the classic argument of, of brand marketing as opposed to kind of specific product marketing or, or a, a marketing for a specific opportunity. I mean, when you develop a brand affinity with a member of a community or a member of a family, their likelihood to kind of be a, a outspoken advocate of that brand uh, can be substantial. So, uh, you know, if you are able to have a, a comprehensive relationship with that person through different media channels, through social media, through email, through a direct buyer relationship, you combine those things and develop a strong affinity, that person will be vocal uh, about the fact that they are a customer of yours. If they really love your product, that becomes a point of pride and kind of evangelizing that becomes a point of pride. And, uh, if they can become a, a local evangelist and whether it's to their mom or it's to someone in their community, um, that's just as, if not substantially more powerful for your brand than anything that you can do in terms of direct targeting because it's coming from a trusted source, not the brand itself. And that has a, a, a sense of credibility to it that's substantially greater than anything you can put in an email. So I am the CMO or the marketing, the VP of marketing of uh, an organization and I'm tasked with figure out, figuring out my data. Mm -hmm. So what kind of things should I be thinking about to buy smart? Because that's, I find I'm really good at selling yeah. uh, through my processes, through my staff, but I'm kind of still learning yeah. what my buy strategy should be. So what kind of things, take me through a little bit, what, what should my thought process be? Sure, I think first and foremost, the number one tip that I can give is Start with the low-hanging fruit. Uh, I think that there's a there's a very much an 80-20 rule in effect with a lot of data. And people, when they start thinking about, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna crack this data problem. I'm gonna go through and and figure out what's in the data. They start thinking about big data. They start thinking about these massive server rooms with petabytes and petabytes worth of information. And how am I gonna parse through all of this? When in reality, from what we've seen, is that you know if a company's doing very little with data, or they have a, a data strategy that hasn't really been looked at in in you know several years. There is a tremendous amount of opportunity in taking very kind of broad strokes and gaining a high level understanding of you know what are in very very large categories uh, the information that's available to me about who my customers are, what they're purchasing, where they came from, uh, and kind of what their likelihood of, of doing it again is. Uh, and doing that kind of analysis does not require having five PhDs in statistics in a room. Uh, you know, uh, for uh, RJ Metrics at 500 bucks a month, you can kind of get those answers and you can do much deeper dive things as well. But really what we encourage most companies to do who are just getting started is answer those initial questions and better deep questions will come. Uh, and I think that a lot of people try thinking very, very hard without having answered any questions at all about what are the top 100 questions I should so be answering. So there is no baseline. Data. Exactly, so establish a baseline, understand what's there. Um, and I think there is such a thing as being uh, far too specific, kind of getting to a level of, of specificity that becomes ineffective. Uh, and really starting out with the broad strokes and understanding where your data is and where you have kind of a strong level of confidence about assumptions that you're making or about inferences that you're making, that allows you to then take that assumption and go a level deeper and kind of split it again and again. And that way you don't risk uh, getting into these kind of you know, hyper segments that really don't end up yielding anything of real value. How do I go about um, understanding, qualifying my service providers? So what kind of questions should I be asking or you know, how do I need to think about my due diligence? When it comes to someone who's going to be working with your data, yes. working with your data, yeah, I think what's really important uh, is I would look at 
experience with companies like your own uh, and, and kind of understanding not just best practices from how do you get into the data and process it and do all the technological aspects, but there are uh, some very kind of qualitative aspects that are specific to industries that, that companies exist in. You know, we work with e-commerce companies, software as a service companies, uh, and because we work with a specific band of companies, we really deeply understand best practices in those areas. Uh, if an automobile manufacturer came to me tomorrow and, and wanted to be the client, uh, I would probably have to think very, very hard about taking on that business because um, it's not something where on day one I can say, I've worked with 20 companies that are you know, a lot like yours. Um, we've seen that there are these best practices and these things really lead to more uh, intelligent, actionable decisions. Uh, and, and those are kind of really the key elements. So, I mean, I would look for domain expertise uh, in particular. And I would also look for, honestly, the, the newness and kind of the, the degree to which the technology is taking advantage of advancements that have come in the last few years. So, you know, are you leveraging the cloud? Are you leveraging distributed computing? Kind of, is there such a uh, implementation requirement that people have to fly in and, and, you know, work for five days within your office to set up this huge data warehouse? Or is there something that's very lightweight and kind of, you know, can allow you to be very, very agile about getting answers very quickly? Uh, because I think with data, it's very easy to get wrapped up in a very long project where you could spend a year getting a system up and running before you get your first answer. And I think that really where business intelligence is going is much, much, much lower time to value because what you need to do to be smart with data is to iterate um, and to get these answers and then identify, have we been asking the right questions? If so, now we have answers that we want to keep an eye on and we want to make sure that we are very kind of adaptive to the answers that we're getting as they change. Or are we not asking the right questions? In which case, we want to completely reorient what we're doing and ask more questions, and we don't want to wait another year in order to do that. Uh, so I think that the kind of agility of the software or the team that you're working with is, is equally important. So tell us a little bit, um, what are you going to talk about at the Conversation Agent Workshop? Uh, we've I've seen, and I'm, I'm going to post this online for, for uh, readers and for everybody to see your TED Talk, which I thought was awesome. Thanks. Kind of understanding the, uh, you know, the data aspects of business intelligence and how not to be afraid of data. And one of the uh, conversations that I'm seeing now in marketers are still grappling with who their customers are, honestly. Sure. Uh, what their CRM system is, and now they're thinking about social CRM, and now everybody's talking about big data. Sure. Uh, really, earlier you said, go back to basics, you know, look at what you have, and so how can we help people, you know, kind of understand the process and take them through the process so that it's doable? Sure, sure. And, uh, you know, big data is, is a big buzzword right now. And I very frequently will say, you know, press the pause button. Forget about big data for a second. Are you doing small data correctly? Uh, kind of the data that, that lives within, uh, you know, the most uh, kind of high level domains within your organization. Are you looking at that? Are you answering questions from that in, a, in an intelligent way? And I think the answer by and large, and even uh, to some degree, if not even more so with larger and later stage companies is, is no. Uh, and I think that really the key to being able to have a, a really strong comprehensive data strategy is understanding what data is available, where the key information is really locked up within that data, and then how do you get at it. Um, and as I mentioned in, in my TED talk, there has been really a, a revolution that's happened over the last five or 10 years where multiple factors have been kind of enabling people at an exponential rate to do more powerful things with data. Um, and that scares some people and it excites some people. And I'm, I'm in the latter category. And I think that a lot of people who will, who will be at this workshop are also gonna be in that category because it, it, it creates opportunity. Um, and there are a number of spaces out there in marketing and in other places that are just being drastically disrupted by the massive amount of data that can be you know, stored, collected, and, and transferred um, at very, very, very low cost by businesses of all stages. Uh, and really, you know, one thing that I think I'll be touching on in the talk is we work largely with startup companies. So we're working with companies that, uh, you know, some of them are substantial, kind of fully scaled, multi-hundred million dollar e-retailers, great. But we also work with pre-revenue companies. We work with companies that, you know, only have a couple of, you know, the first couple of dozen customers. And what's interesting is we're delivering the same analytics and the same kind of caliber of insights to these very, very, very early companies that are deriving, you know, millions of dollars of incremental value for these very, very large companies. So I shouldn't get discouraged if I don't have a lot of data. I can already start using... Yeah. tools to understand who's 
receptive to my messages and to my products sure. and having starting a relationship. Very yeah. true. And the other thing, the flip side of that is, okay, so if you're an earlier stage company, yes, you should definitely feel comfortable that it's within the domain of, of what you can accomplish to get these insights at this stage. This was not the case five years ago. I mean, to do business intelligence well, um, you know, Back, back historically, you need to work with these very large vendors. You go to business objects, Cognos, MicroStrategy, and you spend several hundred thousand dollars on an implementation. These are not practical expenses for companies at that stage. Now they are. And my, my challenge and kind of the flip side of it is, okay, if you're on the other end of the spectrum, if you're one of these very, very large companies, if you're a big marketer, a big retailer, um, you should probably be very aware of the fact that the people who are looking to disrupt your space and move in and steal market share from you are doing very sophisticated things with data and kind of being able to be the entrenched player who you know has the financial resources to hire a bunch of data scientists and kind of do these deep dive analyses. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, before the 80-20 rule, you know, you can do a whole lot of and gain a lot of really valuable insights with a small percentage of kind of the, the potential work that, that can be done. Well, that, that should be kind of scary to people who aren't doing any work at all, even, even at a later stage. Um, and as you know, we're able to deliver business intelligence farther and farther down the long tail, um, we're empowering people down there to be more disruptive to people at the other end of the spectrum. And I think that it's really important for businesses of all sizes to appreciate that uh, you know, there are certainly advantages to being the, the big elephant in the room, but uh, the reality is that there are a lot of significantly more empowered startups today uh, that are capable of disrupting spaces than there ever have been before, and it's because of data and what's happening in that regard.